there's actually zero possibility of the review process actually catching a bad actor who well, wants actually, to get around it. Yeah, who wants to get around it? That's true. Um, yeah. It, it, it does. It's the same idea as like a lock on your door, right? It can, like, it can catch an idiot. <laughs> Scotch. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 461 Jeez. of Coffee with Butterscotch, the game dev comedy podcast of Butterscotch shenanigans. I'm Seth and I'm the games programmer. I'm Adam and I'm the miscellaneous programmer. I'm Sam and I'm the artist. And this is a show where we talk about life, business, and working in the games industry. Today's March 29th, 22 by 4. Before we get started, we have a warning. There's going to be profanity in this show. And we'd also like to thank our recurring supporters over at moneygrab.bscotch.net. Thanks so much for uh, letting us grab your money and supporting the podcast. We appreciate it. Man, we just got right through that intro. I'm so proud. Oh, yeah, man. I have a single, I'm about I have to a single burst. tier. My, single yeah, tier. My, my, my brain was processing, like trying to figure out where can I interject? Where can well, I How do I get in there? I, I just had to keep going. I just, yeah. I just yep. blaze forward, yeah. you know, create no gaps for anybody to squeeze well, in. Well, the other interpretation is, is that, you know, you you didn't give us anything, anything surprising enough that we could be like, oh, it's time for me to interject now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the my, my MO going forward on the podcast is just just be real predictable yeah. and boring and like don't you know, nothing new, no new ideas. Just uh, say the date stay safe. regularly. You know, yeah, I don't want to give you guys anything to work with. Nope. You know? Uh yep. all right. So what's going on in the studio this yeah, week? Happening? Well, uh like well, about a billion things that we you know, we got some stuff cooking that'll be coming out uh, soon, actually, uh that we can talk about. But we can't talk about that this week. Because it's still under the wraps. Mm -hmm. So instead, we're going to talk a little bit about something uh, that is – that's hitting our our YouTube channel. Uh, Yeah. So – it's so so urgent. Well, yeah. Yeah. We got – So here's the the deal. uh We've got – we got a Chinese version of our our announcement trailer made. So let's talk about that. Why did we do that? Where is it going to go? What's it for? And and why don't we – why didn't we do – why don't we do every language? Yeah. So Let's talk about that. We could, we could start the, at the acid of that set of questions and say, you know, localization, translating your game into other other languages. What's it all about? Why do it? Uh, and also, there's like a million languages. Should you do all of them? Should you do mm-hmm. two of them? What should you do? Uh, the answer is uh, there's no good answer. It's a mess. Uh, you just have to try to you know do your best. So the problem with localization, which is the comp- which is the idea of translating stuff, but actually not just trying to carry the meaning exactly over. That's like a raw translation. But localization is trying to convey the same vibe at the same time by having it match the locale better. So like if you got a joke in your language, you have a different joke that makes more sense in that language, you know, that kind of thing. Um, So the idea is that if you have your game and your game content localized for different locales, then people who uh, don't speak English as a first language or at all now get access to your game. So increase your market, right? Yeah. Uh, that's the core idea. Very simple. The problem is that uh, it's really expensive and really hard and really time consuming. It takes a lot of time <laughs> yeah. and money and energy. And a lot of organization. It's just everything about it is really, really hard. Um, and on the one hand, it's, it's, uh, it's like – kind of as hard to do one extra language as it is to do 10, right? Like mm-hmm. a lot of the problems are these higher level problems that once you solve them, they're kind of kind of solved everywhere. But it is still the case that just the sheer volume of stuff happening as you add more and more languages and the, and the cost just goes up, you know, if it's two languages, Linearly. it costs twice as much. And yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so, uh, so it's really expensive and really hard. So the question is why at all and which languages? So, uh, in our case for Crashlands 2, um, what we know about Crashlands as a franchise is that it has a really large player base in mainland China. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, which is interesting because that kind of started out of first. First, it was a lot of piracy. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. Um, there was a then, community. There was a there was a cracked community translated version of Crashlands. Yeah. That was floating around mainland China after the game went live. Uh, that was just su- surprising to us once we discovered it was being played just by. Fuck loads. Mill- millions and millions of people. Of people. <laughs> Which is basically no and zero people in China because there's so many people, but it's still a, you know it's an absolute just, value. A lot of people. Yeah, a lot so. of people. And and that was that was why basically uh, Tencent at the time reached out to us and was like, oh hey, we want we want Crashlands on our new PC platform that was coming out at the time. This is back in 2017. Um, the platform was called Wii Game. It's presumably it's still around. I don't really know what's going around. on with it. 
Uh, and, and so presumably they saw this game and it was like popular and they're like, what the fuck is this? And then they traced it back and saw that, oh, it's, it's from this company over here. Uh, so they asked us if they could, you know, do the official version. And then, so where we ended up yeah, with yeah, after yeah. all of that is that Crashlands has basically, OG Crashlands has basically it's two big markets. In China. It's big in China. Yeah. It's big in the English market. Um mm-hmm the English speaking market. And those are the only two languages it was in. When it came to Levelhead, we were like, well, let's uh, let's see what it means to like actually try to get into like all of the big markets, right? Um, and well, not all, but as many as we can well, the, afford, I mean, the big basically. ones, yeah. Like, <laughs> if you go like look at anybody's list, like a modern AAA title, you know, you go look at like what are all the languages they list, you know, like we're like, what, what's the subset of that we think we can get where we feel like we're really expanding what our market is? Um, so we did 12 languages for yeah. Levelhead. And it was a lot, but the interesting thing with that one, because the kind of game that it was, uh, the, it wasn't, it wasn't that sensitive to like what, how localization was done. Um, cause the, the story didn't impact that much about like not nearly as expensive, game. basically from not, nearly, not nearly that many words. And yeah. So, so it wasn't, so it actually ended up being a, it was a, still a big undertaking, but it actually wasn't too terrible. It was really interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we got to see some cool stuff. So like when we launched Levelhead, if we're looking at the Xbox market where most of our players were, cause it was on, um, game pass, right? So most of our players who played Levelhead played on Xbox and of those players, a majority of the, or I guess a plurality of them, the biggest segment were from uh, Brazil. Brazil. Portuguese, yeah. Brazil's been a giant Xbox and Game Pass market. Just yeah, apparently. Different. And we didn't even know that. You know, we just like, and then we started looking at our stats and it was just like, I don't know, 20% or something. It was a huge yeah, fraction of all of it was from there. And then like, and it was really, it was kind of cool to see how much like, even though like Brazilian was the biggest one, all the other markets were represented. Like in yeah, they're actually in a measurable way, right? Um, and, but it still was the case that some of them got, it got pretty small as we got towards the end of that list, right? I think it was Spanish, Spanish, and like Italian in particular were just like, mm-hmm basically off a lot of the ones a lot of the ones that are typically recommended largely due to uh, a different factor which is not necessarily player count but actually like uh industry review uh Mm -hmm. like infrastructure basically there's a there's a lot more european like ign equivalents or literal igns um in those given languages and so as part of the thing of playing the game of getting a good metacritic score is with these bigger companies is you you also want to translate into some of these markets where it may not even necessarily be a lot of players are going after but it might help do something like increase your overall metacritic score right yeah you know, which can be really important for some companies based on like funding models and things like that so. yeah which unless the translation is bad yeah in which case in which case it's not good backfire <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, because in the end, it still has to be good, right? Um, it's got to be good. Yeah, yeah so, it, but but then these days, like, what, what it looks like to, like, do do Metacritic scores actually do anything for, like, an indie game? Probably yeah, not. Yeah, no, no. Right. Uh, so, uh, it honestly probably doesn't do anything for um, AAA anymore or, either, right? Yeah. Uh, but, the, you know, funding models and, like, how, how, like, big corporations think the world works, uh, how everybody thinks the world works, changes really slowly compared to what's actually happening, right? Mm-hmm. And so... So if you go out in the world and you're like, what languages should I localize my game into? You're going to find a million contradictory and mostly outdated answers. And the fun thing is we don't have better answers either because the, there's no way to know. <laughs> there's no way to know like what the right move is. Yeah. So, and you can't, if you don't, if you don't put your game into a certain language, there's no way of knowing what, what? it would have done in that country, yeah. right? Because yeah. there's also a, there's a circular feedback problem, which yep. is if there's a, there's a, you know, several countries or places in the world where there actually are quite a few people um, who are interested in games, but if it's just conventional wisdom that like, eh, that's a small market, we don't translate for that, mm-hmm. then there's yeah. no data on it and nobody knows and it just kind of stays there. And also way, then right? in that so, locale too, they're used to not having games in their language and so it suppresses the possible size of the games market there, right? Because if, yeah. if there aren't games you can play in your language, you're not going to play games. Do? It's, not, it's yeah. not accessible. And it's possible that like if, you know, if you if you make a game for that language and it just never happens there, you know, mm-hmm. like they may be really pumped about that, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And so, yeah. like, you, you know, you, you can have an outsized uh, uh, impact in smaller markets. Um, but again, like if it's too know. small of a market, then it also wouldn't. And if your game matter. is too expensive <laughs> to localize, yeah. So, so it's basically it's this game where like it's so much gambling. Where, basically. Yeah, yeah. You're just gambling because there's no way to know. And the truth is that if your game is in uh, some locale, if it's available in a person's language, then 
you make it possible for your game to have a market there. Like that's that's just true, right? But just like a regular release in the in your one market in your own language, whether or not anybody plays it is a, you know a different question. It's a, a crapshoot <laughs> already, right? So just because yeah. it now is possible, that doesn't actually mean it happens, and that's where the gambling comes in, right? Especially when well, it's that's really where expensive. The, it's also where the marketing comes in, which is yeah. to round back to the, to the start of this. What's been going on on the Chinese side? Which is yeah, be, so. Took the, tra- the trailer and did some localization work to get a essentially a localized version of the launch trailer with the voiceover and stuff uh, into Chinese, so we could post yeah. that over there. Yeah, and so and we have a so and we have a huge benefit with being a sequel where we already know that there's a big Chinese player base for Crashlands Two, right? Yes, we don't know because Crashlands Two is only in Chinese and English. We don't know if there's also a market in other languages, right? So that so those ones are still a gamble. Right. Yeah. Um, but we do know there's a big Chinese audience there. And so that means that that's where we're shift. That's where we're keeping our marketing, our marketing efforts and our translation efforts are, are kind of focused on that because we know that it can pay off and the other markets, uh, who knows? Right. Mm-hmm. But I guess, as I said, it's a circular problem. If we don't actually do stuff there, then it decreases likelihood that anything happens. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. But anyway, so, so for, so we've been focusing our efforts on Chinese because we have limited time. It's really expensive. It's really hard. And we know that that's a, and we a have a, a person in the studio who speaks Chinese. And, and that's can, the other. Can vet the, yeah. yes. you know, vet, vet the yeah. product, you know. And then, I think yeah. that's the trickiest thing about it because Crash Tunes is a humor game, right? There's, yeah. it's about, especially the trailers and stuff like that. They're always supposed to be fun and the kind mm-hmm. of dumb, right? And the, the, the real challenge in doing like a translation effort then in this case is actually maintaining a level of humor, right? Or the same kind of humor, right? Because sometimes people, even people in English, you know, you'll say like, oh, hey, can you, you know, if you give us like a sample script of something in our, in our voice, you know, they take certain things almost too far or whatever else, right? Um, maybe becoming almost like kind of a jerk or, or just too punny and dumb. There's, there's an, there's a particular tone you're trying to hit, right? But another thing is like uh, the humor that, that is often used in Crash News 2, especially in things like item tool tips is this really specific, uh, subversion of expectations. Yes. So like, as, as an example, I don't think this is one, but like, let's say, let's say you get like a, a weird rock or something, then the tooltip will probably say something like, you notice that if you hold this for a while, your arm gets tired, <laughs> right? Yeah. right? Which is like, you think that the that the sentence is going to end with something about the item, but yeah. actually it's just about the experience of holding something heavy, just right? Just anything heavy, um, yeah. Which is, that's where kind of like the dumb humor is. It's like, you, it just twists and goes a direction that you weren't expecting, yeah. right? And, so and I don't know if that even works in every language. Yeah. Just yeah. grammatic, you totally. know, how and sentences so are set up. The thing is that sure, who then... Took it, you know, taking it upon himself to do the the essentially the humor translation of the uh, of the trailer is very funny. Like he's a very funny dude. In I assume in Chinese, I, of course, I can't tell, but like in English, <laughs> he is. Which I, to me, like, I assume that he isn't. Then therefore, in Chinese too, and so. It's really nice, and that's probably the only way we'd be able to do it. Is like you have a person who you know is funny. You have a long working relationship with, and who also then can yeah vet. Not even not even just. Since in his case he's working, he worked on the, the localization itself for the trailer. But that can also vet if the like a voice actor who's doing it is giving it the correct punch. You know what I mean? Like the correct emphasis mm-hmm. and stuff. All the things that literally like you could just as the person who make the thing like you you want someone who has enough care in that whole chain of translation efforts, right, or localization efforts to make sure that it's actually coming through and it's not just like it's not just some kind of weird other thing, but not, not hitting the marks that you need it to. Right. So it's it's very unique in in that case. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is, this is the biggest challenge in my opinion, when it comes to localizing stuff is that, is that you don't, you can't vet it. Yes. Right. And if you're, if you're lucky or if you have enough resources that you can hire people, but again, you still have to be lucky because eventually if it's a language you don't speak and you're the one who wants, who's trying to set the quality bar. Right. Uh, then you at some point else. you got to trust somebody and, mm-hmm. and that's it. And then it stops there. You just have to be like, okay, I just trust if this person says it's good, it must be right. 
and or similarly if this person says it's not good then mm -hmm. that means you it's, have to go deploy more resources to resolve that in some way right and you have to be able to mm -hmm. trust that and, and it just stops there and this is this is true in lots of other disciplines too right uh like i can't see what sus doing in the code i don't know why he's done things the way that he does and i just have to trust that like okay that's going to make sense to make sure this is a game right. that runs over his device and that kind of stuff right so that that's kind of true it's kind of true everywhere, but but this is one of those weird things. It's like because like the art, everybody can just look at and evaluate. You don't need yep. to know the language, right? So when it comes to the, and like the gameplay experience, like everyone's using the same inputs, like everyone everyone has actually that kind of same interaction with it. So the localization is that one domain where it's extremely visible and it's a core part of your actual experience moment to moment but the people making and designing the thing actually can't tell like it's so fucking weird because like, like we like we can play the game in japanese or chinese or portuguese or whatever and not experience it at all the same way a speaker yep. of that language experience. basically don't like, experience it's just it, right? we just do yeah we just do not experience that aspect of the game the, yeah. the language and a part. terrible garbage translation to us will look exactly the same as a Perfect, an amazing, one. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so, so that's where all that, that I think to me that's where the like, fundamental challenge comes into all of this is like at the end you finally just, do, you finally do all the work and you get the translation back and you're like, uh, is this good? okay? <laughs> oh, well, it, well <laughs> it exists for sure. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, well, and, and there's and there's this this extra like weird layer of of. Um, Cost benefit because like, people always talk about machine translations and mm -hmm. like oh yeah like oh I got this indie game and like I I could tell that they just used Google Translate or whatever right um, but one one thing that is that is definitely accelerating these days is you know the prevalence of large language models and AI mm -hmm. that's like built around natural language processing um, and machine translations are getting you know a little bit better a little bit better all the time and human translations aren't like like we're humans right so like we aren't They're as a species getting we aren't we aren't getting better at translating things as a species yeah, but of course um, the goal is for the machines to catch up to the people right is so yeah that's where the and so there's this set. there's this weird thing where like you could like it you could actually uh pay people to translate stuff and they'll do a worse job than a machine right now mm -hmm. uh that is definitely a thing that can happen and you can't know that that's what happened yeah. <laughs> right? that's, that's right? the same problem exists no matter where you're getting your translation from right which is the ability to assess the quality of it machine generated ai generated or person generated is yeah you just Ill. can't know so it's like Terrifying. it's like a schrodinger's translation where like once the game comes out you'll find out <laughs> you'll yep. find out if it was good yeah because the uh, or you can like know. try to get play testers you know yeah and they'll, uh, and they'll tell language. you yeah yeah uh yeah so so yeah, so anyway, so so it's hard to I'll get into like it. the specific look stuff without being like the can of worms keeps opening, you know. But we're so the focus though is on this this Chinese trailer, right? And so so we basically know we got a we got a big Chinese market, um, and we want to make sure that we're starting to produce our not just that the game is localized in all these languages, but also that we start doing some intentional marketing efforts and have some of our marketing content also be targeted and then, you have to, and then you have to decide like okay do we do just like translated subtitles because that's one option right mm -hmm. uh or do we make fully localized versions of our trailers and screenshots and everything right and the fact is the more of your stuff is fully truly localized the more likely it is that that market actually gets to blow up because when the people look at it they're like oh this is actually this is for me this is for me right because if they see your content and it's got subtitles in their language but all the content is in english they'll be like okay well this is still not for me it's just might i might be able to play it right which is a very different kind of a vibe yeah uh, it's, so. it's easy to just kind of put yourself in that in like in that experience because we've all done this where like maybe you like pop open steam and some game pops up and everything's in japanese or something right mm -hmm. and you look at it and like for for most people if you don't speak japanese you'll see that and be like um this this looks like a lot of work. Yeah, yep. <laughs> to kind of like, I like, and you don't know if the game is actually translated, and they just didn't translate the trailer, or you yeah, know, you, what, don't, you just don't the, know the deal yeah. is. You don't know to yeah. what degree it's for you, right? And uh, and so so for for Chinese, we want to make sure that that the whole thing, top to bottom, you know, feels like it's for the players because again, we know they're there. Uh, so we wanted to remake the announcement trailer. Um, and then this was this was this new interesting puzzle, right? Because we're like, okay, we got the we got the first round of localization back for the game, which means we can now reshoot scenes from the trailer that have English text in them because now they'll have Chinese text, right? And the question is, should we or should we just change the voiceover, right? And again, we're like, mm -hmm. so so the ultimately do, we just do we it all the way. It, we want it to go all the way in so that that's fully localized, right? And and so the the strategy that we chose to try to make it as easy as possible, given that it's not easy, right? 
was to say, yeah. let's because also the, the at the at the very end of this, we have a video editor who has to put it all together. And now they're listening to a voiceover or looking that at some titles that mm-hmm. they can't understand. Right. And so so if they're trying to like make video content that like perfectly lines up with the audio content and with the with the so what the subtitles are saying. Right. If it's their language, no big deal, right? But how do you do it when it's so? So when we were trying to decide what to do for this, we, we know we're like we can't just make a new trailer that is a, a fully new thing, right? A terrible idea, given the because constraints. yeah, because with all these constraints, and then by the time we get to the editing round, it's just way too hard to make that work. And so what we decided to do is is still remake the trailer with new shots to have the fully look less content but the but same shot shot for shot exact same time points it takes yeah. the original trailer the original you know trailer uh script and and translate it and have some it flexibility in the translation but make sure that it it will line up maybe just make sure that if you put it on the english video it makes sense right yep. again exact same time points and everything and so sure did that and as far as we know did a great job because again we can't tell right but uh but it he well, was, sure didn't do the voiceover we, we he didn't we do the voiceover, voice, yeah. A but, voice actor. yeah but he wrote yeah. he wrote the script um and or which is kind of a combo of again of a translation versus some new stuff and he was having a lot of fun with it um uh, and, about yeah, so, puns, so, so it's hopefully, it's hopefully good. And it sounds great. We, we found a voice actor and, um, you know, and, it, and it's really fun to then hear it and see it all in Chinese. Um, and we, so we got that back and we're going to start putting it up on the places it needs to go. Um, and it's just very cool to get that stuff back, you know, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot. It's cool to see. There's now there's one, there's one other thing that's kind of interesting about, about China in particular, which is. Uh, it's like when, when we launched cra- the official version of, of Crashlands in China, um, that was through Tencent and we had to go through all of this like government review um, mm-hmm. where there's a lot of there's a lot of rules about what you can show, what you can say, what you can't say, what you can or can't talk about. Um, and e- even to the point where I think we had to like change the color of blood in the game to purple Yep. yep. so that it wasn't blood. It was just, you know, a, a, a visual effect of something mm-hmm. coming out. <laughs> um and we had to, you know, change, change quite a bit of uh, like text and dialogue and story stuff just based on all of those different requirements. And, and you always see uh, people criticizing say like Marvel for uh, cutting out certain scenes of their movies and stuff yep. so that they can release it in China. Or they even they even construct the movie in a way that uh, say like LGBT characters can be just sort of deleted from the movie by keep making mm-hmm. sure they're never in a scene that like – actively moves the plot forward or something like that. Um, yeah, which you don't see so which, much for the Chinese market, but you do see that for like the Russian market and, and some others. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's all these different like things that that uh, people do to kind of either either let something get through a government review or to sort of cater to the specific biases of the of the, the predominant culture in a in a space, right? Um, we're not doing that. We're not doing any of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even, even with OG uh, Crashlands, it was basically because we already weren't doing any kind of like particular commentary about anything in China. We, or, well, we had a lot right? of satirical stuff, kind of poking fun at, especially like of of politics kinds yeah. of things. We had a lot of like the, the second book, act, yeah. which so there was had to change a quite a bit. To, he, he did a lot uh, of work to yeah. like massage that overall framing in that uh, second zones, but it wasn't so much about how the government was kind of dumb, basically, which is roughly yeah. the same as, like the BS yeah. being, you know, all puffed up and not ever getting anything done. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah, even then, I think just, in the end, I think it actually wasn't that much that had to no, no, change to get there. And it didn't actually change the meaning of what we were doing, right? It just mm-mm. made it so that there were some inferences that you could have been making that you could decide we were implying that we had to then that we actually sure. weren't trying to apply in the first place. Yeah. That we had to yeah, set that up. So, uh, but with Crashlands too, we're doing a lot more stuff. It's a lot more complex, uh, and we have no interest in trying to massage everything to meet arbitrary. Nah. Yeah, rig- which which puts which puts Crashlands too in kind of an it's it's in that that gray zone that a lot of that, that just about every game exists in in China, which is um, it's not published through a Chinese company yeah. like. Like ten cent, it's not going through the government approval, and and people's access to it is sneaky. You know, yep. it's it's not a, it's not about it's not about like getting it from an official you know Chinese uh, platform or whatever. You know, it's going through Steam and 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 Google Play and stuff like that. Um, and and yeah, but Google Play doesn't operate in China. Um, and yep. Steam operates in two ways in China actually. One unofficially, which is basically because the government hasn't blocked. 
the main application yet. The government's just kind of ignoring it. Yeah, it's for, it's basically like while. small enough comparative to everything else that they haven't done that yet. But it's it's one of those things that at any given moment it's something to worry about though, right? It's because yeah. Because a significant fraction of our wish list, a significant fraction of our future audience is going to be the Chinese market on Steam. Uh, and that plug could just be pulled at some point. So it, yeah, it, it is. It happened today. Yeah, it could happen at any time. And so it is one of the things we to, that we're constantly having to like worry about. And why we can't just be like, all right, we're all in on China and not even English territories. You know, like we that would be yeah, a very yeah, safe, yeah. dangerous thing to do. Um, but uh, – yeah, so it's it's an it's an interesting. It's, it's, yeah, the other way that Steam operates is I think they still have they have a they have an official Chinese version of Steam because basically to operate in China you have to do so in conjunction with a Chinese company, right? And so Steam partnered with was it like Blue something some one of the big Chinese tech companies, but not the ones that everybody hears about, but one of the other ones um, to make Steam China, which mm-hmm. last I knew had like ten games on it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, because again everything has to go through government review there. Yeah. And and they and the government actually has a limit on how many games can be released per year, like in the country. Yeah, <laughs> well, really uh, annoying. So yeah, when Crashlands yeah. came out originally, that was kind of the, when that was stuff was first starting. So we were at that point, it was treated more like, oh, this is just a bureaucratic process. But there's not. It's like it's hard and arduous and expensive to do it, but. You can do it. But if you do it, right? you're fine. Yeah. Uh, but then really even just like a couple of years after that, like starting in 2019, but then definitely during like the pandemic mm-hmm. years, right? Uh, there was – I think there was one year where they let in one game, one non-Chinese yeah. game, right? Uh, so so we kind of treat it as like we can't – we can't – even if we wanted to, we can't operate officially uh, in China. But Yeah, and, and there's – and it, like the regulatory – uh, environment there is is just whiplash. Like you know, they'd be like, oh, by the way, like this month suddenly uh, the Chinese government decided that every game developer has to put has to implement this like server connection SDK thing that that limits playtime and validates identity for miners and like all this yeah. all this w- wild stuff. Um, yeah. At a certain point, we're just like, no, nah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's too it's just too much. Uh, Can we not? Yeah. Uh, uh, but anyway, so, so yeah, but but it's, it's it is very cool though. Like all this said, it's hard, takes a lot of effort, it's a pain in the ass, it's expensive, uh, and you do have to choose your markets really carefully because of all of that, right? But it is very cool though when you get to make a thing for this other audience who uh, doesn't speak the language that you speak, and you get to and you just get to put it out and see people's responses to it. You know, so I'm really excited to see yeah, to see in a way the response to it. Yeah, it's basically I think it's going to go live. Uh, we have a company helping us do. Um, some marketing stuff on Chinese platforms Chinese in China. Stuff. So, yeah, so they're going to get that posted today while we're talking, basically. Uh, and then we'll put it up on Steam and YouTube and all that uh, probably next really week. Um, response yeah. From it. Yeah. yeah. And like, in, in, a, in a way, it's actually nicer to publish stuff in a language that you don't speak because then when you see a bunch of comments and stuff under it, you're just like, yeah. nice, people are talking about it. Yeah. And, Honestly, you, there is and a, you can't see it. There is actually one weird thing I wanted to mention because it's – there is something about having a like a that bit of a barrier, I guess, in terms of yeah. being able to really understand what's going on, that actually makes it feel kind of just almost like nicer. Yeah, it puts it all everything is kind of in language. a positive light instead of as yeah. yeah. Was, like anytime I open anything normally, when I'm like before I start reading the comments, I have to take a breath. I'm like, okay, oh yeah, get ready, you know. Um, Time to plunge into the outrage bath, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's yeah, like, and also there's like there's tonal stuff because you know, like some people are sarcastic and blah blah. You know, but like even if you even if you if you're looking at a language that you kind of like speak as a second language but not that well, you know, even that would be more like it's more yeah, of a positive experience. Yep. That, yeah, because it's like like yeah, you know, they might have like a gripe here and there. I think I'm not sure, but overall, you know, they're talking about the game and that's great. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's that's been a pretty interesting process that we've gone through these these past couple of weeks. Uh, let's get on to some questions. Let's go. That sound good? All right. Uh, the highest uploaded question from podcast.bscotch.net comes from Upunga Topak, who mm-hmm. says, I'm a web developer at a game company, and it's been awesome to hear Adam's perspective on developing systems to assist game devs. I enjoyed playing the indie title Cross Code a few years back, and it surprised me to learn that it was an HTML5 game. Huh. I'm currently doing personal game dev nonsense in Godot. Adam, I'm curious, have you ever explored the concept of making a game within a front-end web framework? If so, any opinions? I uh, This is an easy one because I have not. And the main reason is because I'm not a game developer, is, <laughs> is the fact of it. Uh, 
which is it is funny because right? like when i joined this like I've, I've done some game jams you know with with sam and seth uh but even for most of those like the first few i was doing trying to do a little bit of game programming you know but for most of those i was just building the web tech part of it you know uh and yeah. adam's always found that much more like utility things that are not um experiential with like a, a vague hard to interpret outcome like i think adam you're you have a harder time with those kinds of things versus things that like yeah it's just do uh, something specific yeah so, I, I really like it when there when there's a well sh- or even if the problem isn't well shaped yet i guess if if the i don't know it's like this with a really well shaped problem even if i have to figure out what the shape of it is but like a clear problem that's just like hey we're trying to make x happen get that mm-hmm. to happen right like, and you know when it's happened because it, you can measure that yeah, and look right, at it. Right. <laughs> and I think, and I think even game programming, I could, I could potentially have like been into, right? Because that's, but that would have been the part after someone else was like, okay, here's what we want to do, right? And like, I would want to have a little bit of involvement there because that impacts the the job of them making it happen, right? But mostly to make sure I can make it happen, not because I am interested in like the design part of games, right? Right, right. Uh, which is interesting because I'm, I'm really interested in the design part of like other kinds of problem solving. But for some reason, for games, it was just never something that I was particularly interested in. Which is all to say, I've I've frequently wondered what all these because there's there's some a handful of really interesting sounding uh, game development kind of platforms for front end stuff, right? Um, and I've constantly thought to myself, oh, I should really dig into those and like see what they're like, right? But then just never have because I just don't have any interest in it, you know. Uh, so that's the that's basically the answer to that. I just I just I love web development. I think it's a cool discipline, and I think the problems are really because like to me the problems are so interesting. But it's all networking and data storage and like managing logic and how and like the logic of how do you just have multiple people dealing with stuff? How do you handle scale? You know, like. I love all of that stuff, um, but that's very separated, right, from the yeah. actual details yeah. of of games. Yeah, and something that's something that I always think about HTML5 stuff is like I, I I feel honestly feel bad for the game maker team because they added HTML5 as a as a target export uh, to Game Maker probably like ten years ago. It was a while ago. Yeah, it's been, it's been like, around for a while, but it's only recent. Once they got bought by Opera, that they started like really putting a lot. Is that it? Maybe like, like six years ago or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I, like when that first came out, I tried exporting some basic projects we had to HTML5 yeah. and there was all kinds of weird stuff. And then I started looking through the documentation of things that weren't working very well. And I would say if I were to just ballpark it, I would say maybe like five to 10% of the things that Game Maker does. If you go to like functions that it has, if you go to the documentation, like, by the way, this doesn't work in HTML5, yeah. or yeah. this doesn't work the way you would expect in HTML5. Yeah. But or- I will say, though, that's at, that's in large part because they're adding HTML5 to an existing platform, right? Yeah, which uh, is built around, like, file operations. Yeah, and, which is you – know, because, like, because like, when you're on the web, like, you are limited because the because a browser is a sandbox environment that, like, doesn't let you talk to the file system, at least not very easily. It does, it's kind of like exporting to the Nintendo Switch. Yeah, like, exactly. like it's, suddenly it's you've got very, this whole new set of constraints. Yeah, it's a you know? super constrained platform. But the modern – like, the modern browser tech and, like, the modern APIs that are available in browsers um, – are actually really good these days to the point where I do think that if you started if you started making making a game engine from scratch today and you wanted to support web as a platform plus all the other platforms you know so that you just got to, so that from the outset you got to actually like design for that uh, I think you could basically do anything you wanted to on yeah. the web platform well, this today. Is, and this is kind of the, the weird question of like who's who's making web browser games. Yeah, to mm-hmm. me the problem is how do you actually make a living making web browser games? Yeah, because this is the weird problem is like HTML5 has all these constraints. And so, of course, like the game maker team has to like work night and day to try to make sure every new thing they do. It, it's kind of like the conversation you just had about like Internet Explorer versus the other browsers. Like, you always got to do everything twice in totally different ways. Well, and especially um, if and like if, if, if you want your games to like work on Safari – uh, you're fucking toast. <laughs> like that's gonna be because yeah. like a, br- a browser is not a browser. A browser is not, not a browser. browser right? yeah. They're all they're all different. So even if you make an HTML5 game, you don't even know if it's gonna work on the browsers. But then uh, it's got to be the case that like for, uh, from game makers' perspective, they have to put all this work in to get this thing to to function. And then like who who's actually professionally making HTML5 games? Like yeah, there's yeah, well, nothing I think market the- for it. It's just a different. It's a very different market than what you consider for the rest of the other stuff. Yeah. Right? Well, I think it's a more uh, self defined market, yeah. right? Because like because there's there's not a there's like I can't think I can't think of a single marketplace that 
serves up web games, right? That like, if I was going to make well, a web if you're game, like, at, where would I go to, to distribute it? I think if you're looking at like, um, you know, Congregate and Newgrounds and that sort of like the game, basically places where you do go to play games in a browser, which yeah. they but used you to go there to sell games. That's I don't that's I don't know how the money works anymore yeah. there. I know it used to be the case that those platforms would actually they would pay for development of these small games, right? Because that was our whole thing. They they need people coming back to the site regularly, et cetera. So yeah, they because they're selling ads. Pay for these small. Yeah. yeah, but that's when it was like flash games, right? So I don't know yeah. if that it's I don't know how games. that market has persisted. I don't know. I don't know enough. I know it has well, persisted, I, but I don't know enough about the I also think that like from a, from a scale perspective, trying to think about it's so like, you know, Crash Ants 2 is, you know, it's like a few hundred megabytes by now of, you know, stuff. And so if, if you, you know, if you download on Steam, it doesn't happen immediately. Like you got to get, you got to get all those files, right? Um, and try to think about, you know, by the time we get the game out, if it's going to be 400 megabytes or like however, however much stuff is in there. And like, that's a tiny, tiny game compared to. Yeah, most triple A games, games yeah, right? Yeah. Like, like you want to, you want to get, you know, Baldur's Gate. Well, it's a hundred gigs, so yeah. buckle up. You know, like you couldn't play that in a browser, even if you wanted to. Like, no. like how it's, would it well, even it's fucking for, work? It is for yeah. a very particular kind of game, right? It's, it's kind of like that Flash games experience that I think a lot of us of the age we are currently have had as as kids playing on new grounds or yeah, or, uh, what was that one? Those like, games were sick. Games or whatever. Yeah, they're yeah. great. All sorts of fun yeah. stuff, right? Uh, and those do, yeah, they do definitely exist. I don't, they're all substance, no flash, you know, which is yeah. ironic cause they were all made in flash, but, uh, yeah, but they, yeah. you know, they, they couldn't, they couldn't have insane cutscenes and cinematics and special effects and 3d mod. Like you could do, you could do like a little bit of 3d stuff. Uh, but once you start going overboard with like textures and all of that, then suddenly it, it's just too big. Yeah. And, and I, and now you can do full load, 3d you know? in the browser. Right. But it's, yeah, you're going to run into performance limitations. I, I, I would kind of think like, like the browser is kind of like mobile, like the constraints feel really similar. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, but without the, the ability but, to easily modify, but there's, it, I guess. yeah, there's not a marketplace for it. I yeah. think is the, is the problem. Um, and I think in the same way that mobile suppressed the value of games dramatically, right, to bring them basically to zero, more or less, right, I think because because of the constraints of the early web when games were being made, like mm-hmm. we're talking about like various little flash games and stuff, right, uh, and even still with the constraints of today, it's just it's it's harder to deploy a game, a big game to the web. Then that's also made it so that the community of people who like find their games in browsers, like basically who go find browser games, right, have basically been trained for a generations, basically, right? Yeah. That web games it. are small and free because they're all ad supported, right? So I think it, to me, it's the market and they're time wasters. You know, it's just like you just—it's just some little thing. Yeah. Throw ten minutes into it; it's good time, and then you move on with your day. Yeah. It's not supposed to be something that has an impact on you emotionally or. You yeah. <laughs> well, I think this is this is the problem: is that is that even if you make a game that is really big and really cool and really deep and so on, that could be deployed on the web. In the same way that if you make a game that can be deployed on mobile, where you're looking at it, you're like, hey, this like this breaks the mold. This is like way bigger than what people think of as like a mobile game or a web game, right? Uh, that that market not matter will not pay for it. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. matter actually that you did that. Yeah. And I think because like to me, like the last refuge of being able to make a living selling games today is console and PC. Um, mm-hmm. With the exception of things that are then supported by the marketplaces themselves, like subscription services and things, where there, where there's somebody doing curation and basically paying for licensing up front somewhere, something like that. Um, and even that, like those those appear and then disappear, like they just keep on appearing mm-hmm. and disappearing. Uh, the only place that's been a stable source of being able to actually like make a sizable game, sell it, make a living doing it, is PC and mobile. Yeah. I, I would say this is actually this is, console, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this is actually an active choice by by the platforms because um, something that I don't know if you guys remember XCOM mm-hmm. on iPad. Yeah. So that was twenty dollars, which mm-hmm. people were like, what the fuck, twenty dollars for an iPad game? But it was also it was also a PC game and all of that. But on PC, know? it was forty uh, or sixty 60. or sixty. Probably yeah, 60. PC is full price. All right, so yeah, it still had that same like yeah, mobile is a yeah, third so price. It's still, and that, the same which game. is important, right? Because we're talking about like uh, oh, it's an expensive mobile game, right? But it was still a third. It's the same fucking game, but it's still being sold at a third the price yeah. as on their platform. Not only because. The, the prices it's are suppressed mobile. there. There's yeah. no other reason why yeah. that's but, happening. But the suppression of prices comes from the format of the store, right? So so like what was true at that time was – that was kind of close to like when we launched Crashlands as well on, on uh, iOS. 
and Android. And at that time, you could get featured on the App Store and you would have the week. You'd be featured yep. for a week. You'd be on the front page of the game section or the RPG section, or if you got editor's choice, which is what happened with Crashlands, you're on the front page of the whole ass App Store yeah. for a week. We had that on and iPad specifically because they have a separate. Yeah. 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 We, had, we had like a, like the, that, yeah, that like editorial feature on iPad and then we're like number three in the carousel on, on yeah. mobile or and actually at that time this was when itunes and the app store were like with this one and the same and so people who wanted to like look at music would open up itunes oh i forgot they lands. also had separate yeah they separate out games yeah too. so so like there was a time where where everything was pooled together and the amount of exposure that you could get Insane. was was enough to sell a lot of copies right and now it's all you know it's algorithmic. If you do get a feature, it's like a for micro a feature for like a day in a specific niche area of like people already looking for that thing. And so, uh, so instead of, so you, you can't get that kind of like wall immediate wall coverage basically. volume. Yeah. Yeah. And instead a lot of things are algorithmically driven based on download numbers and traffic and, and stuff like that. And so, you know, instead free games get surfaced, uh, and the goal for those is they just kind of continuously pump ad dollars into them to keep them at the top of the algorithmic charts. And like that's how they kind of emulate the sort of featuring that you used to just get from the platform. Um, and so again, like these are all just these are all just structural formatting decisions that the platforms make, which then either Cascade. makes it so that yeah, either makes it so that paid games are worth something to people or worth nothing to people, right? Yeah. Um, and so there's not really much we could do about it, but but just keep kind of like well, uh, finding interesting opportunities and ways to to navigate those spaces. Yeah, you and, know, and, and um, stay on top of as they change over time, right? And, and this is also why the cross platform strategy is so useful, right? And and also why like if you're making a web game, it's it's hard to make games that'll work like everywhere and also on the web still. But I think that's mostly yes. and at this point, I think that's more of an engine thing because you t I think you technically could do it now if the engines really supported it but the incentive for the engines to support it is low because they don't have a lot of customers themselves who are like generating revenue off of web games right so there's going to yeah. be this kind of lag uh, but but to set so to your point about like how these markets behave and like why everything has to go to free this is the same on console also right because the consoles basically have their big featured things anything that's not up there is just gone right it's kind of so, buried yeah. but it's different because it's, it's not really because they don't you can't really like use price as a way to get it visible, except on Switch to an extent. But everywhere else, like you just you just don't get seen. Actually, <laughs> you're either you're either featured or you're not there, right? And uh, and so so when I say like it's still possible to like make money on console, that's got a huge fucking asterisk on it because it's only if you have a way to get featured. Got to get that featuring, yeah. yeah. And then of course, like when it comes to browser stuff, uh, like you're saying, there's no marketplace. There's no, yeah. there's no store. So so if you wanted to launch your own browser game, you're going to be doing it kind of like on your own site. And then you got to figure out, okay, I got to come up with some kind of like a user management system. And I have to figure out how to process payments and handle taxes across all these countries, which yeah. normally the, the platform would do for you, right? So like Apple would handle your taxes, Google would handle your tax, right? So now suddenly you've got like a trillion administrative problems to solve. That is like, none of this is worth it. And, you have to, and then you have to figure out <laughs> so, how, how do people actually find it, right? Because now you're going to be relying on basically Google that's search. That's the biggest one, right? to be honest. The other ones yeah, are there's no no traffic coming in to your site. Yep. Yeah, yeah. so yep. the whole thing is just kind of... But it's the same as everything else, too, uh, is that at any moment, doomed. Google can change its algorithm and then Alice and your game's gone, you know? So, like, mm -hmm. so yeah. I don't, I, to me, like, I think the web has... I love the web. I think it's great. It's got so many things that are excellent. I think for, for what games are and all the markets that are around, what people's expectations are around games... I think it's an extremely hard platform to uh, mm -hmm. try to find success on. But but if you're doing it for fun, though, it's a great platform. Yeah, yeah everything's Super fun. fun. For yeah. fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but if you're trying to make a living, I, I just honestly don't know how you do it. Yeah. Some people must. I'd be really interested to hear from anybody who's like definitely making do. web yeah. games for a living. You know? Yep. I mean, we all played co-op. So oh, yeah. I could, you know, and GURP. So I could think of a couple of games made mm -hmm. by the same person uh, mm -hmm. that, that I know about and played. Yep. Uh, our next question comes from Fraser, who says, are there any plans to ship game changer level patches over the air to subvert app store or platform review processes? Mm. I could see it enabling React Native style things, at least when a bug is on the game changer layer alone. We did this so, a little no. bit with OG Crashlands. Yeah, we did do this with OG uh, Crashlands. Oh, yeah. The campaign yeah. data was pulled when you booted the game. So if we changed yeah. something on the web, we could essentially have that fix in immediately. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, and we yeah. did deliver at, right after we launched. We we had, we also had so many 
bugs in the game itself that we had to be shipping a lot. Um, but it was at that at that time extremely painful for us to to make new builds and deploy them. Part of the reason why we separated it so we could do yeah, part of it so that we could part of yeah, the bugs. So, so stuff that we could that were actually just bugs in the in the story Text stuff that we quests, could yeah. deliver over the wire right um, was stuff that we then fixed that way and we and we deployed actually a lot of fixes that way um, mm-hmm. for the first like six months or a year or something like that after mm-hmm. launch um, and then eventually because it was it eventually kind of turned into a legacy problem where it was like oh how does this thing work and you know like and as and it went because it was a, it was a separate application that we were using to make it all go and so it eventually became kind of a hindrance but at least for the first year i think or so or, or really for the, until we stopped working on crashlands it was extremely mm-hmm. useful to be able to do that the goal wasn't specifically to subvert apple review um and in fact, if that was our goal, they would have kicked us off the store. Yeah, instantly. and also, yeah. they like if we're changing something thirty hours into the campaign story, they weren't going to review that anyways. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, they're not going to know. Uh, that, so it's fine. But but also, we didn't like we launched the game in English only, and so mm-hmm. this is this to me is actually one of the bigger things is if we wanted to change something live in Crashlands Two, uh, we could only do it if we didn't change any text. Yeah. Right, because the the it's translation be, loop is there's long. Still, there's still know? a lot of stuff that you could fit in that bucket, though, with the game change. Right, there's a shitload of stuff. Actually, most yeah. of it, most of the data is not language stuff. Right? Yeah, yeah. But that if, means if we like would have to kind of balance uh, or tweaking. Uh, yeah, you know, what, some, just some weird yeah. things. To go on. Yeah, but there's also kind of branching problems, right? Which is, let's say, you know, we're working on some new stuff in the game, some new. Uh, some new quest lines or whatever. And like some of them are, are part, part finished or, or that kind of thing. And then, and then we find out, Oh, there's this like bug that we want to like deploy a game changer patch to the players to just fix that one thing. Right. Mm-hmm. And then, and then leave out everything else that we've been working on. Um, that would be kind of difficult to separate those things out. Um, and so, we're, we're because of all that stuff, and because we don't want anybody to get the impression that we're trying to subvert any any uh, review processes, because we're not. Mm-hmm. Um, then, yeah, the what you get is what you've got in the game. Like it's it's packaged up and baked into the the project, and we're not doing any sort of live downloading of yeah. of game changer data. I will say another big part of that is is actually the reality is that the main reason we needed to do that was because the build and deploy timeline was so fucking long and it was just so hard to do back then that it was it was actually required in many ways, I think, to in order to be able to fix all those bugs and, and have a more, you know, reactive uh I guess patching for any player issues. We kind of had to think about it as a way think about a way to separate it because we didn't have our any of our DevOps principles or pipeline stuff in place to make it so that just making the builds, which was again was the thing that was annoying. Uh wasn't so and we only had we had one computer with Game Maker on it, which was mine. Yeah. And so when we needed to deploy uh, a patch to you know Steam, iOS, and Android, then my computer was out of commission for a few hours, yeah. making builds, and then I'm you know ma- like manually uploading Dragging those builds around. to those platforms and and testing each testing each yeah. build myself. Um, and so I think and, it's, yeah. it's that, which is that now we can build, we do multiple builds per day, right? So that's not for really, all platforms. For all platforms, it's just not an issue anymore. Yeah. And then I think you pair that with we've, because of that capacity, then on the build side, we want to test stuff before it goes out. Even if it seems like the sort of thing that's like a small little bit, it's like, yeah, I verified it when I made the change, you know, in game on the game changer side. Worked on my machine. Worked on my machine. I'm going to push it, but I still want QA to look at it before I send it out to get that second, like, correct. It did, it didn't do something fucking weird. Uh, it does work because I think big thing we've learned is like, we just don't want to have your, every time you push a patch, you are opening up the chance to deploy bugs too. Right. So ideally there's at least one firewall between you and full deployment that helps get some of that stuff out of. And you could the still get that even if you did have like, cause if, oh, if, you if, still if, will get it right. There's no way to not, I think. No, no. I mean, I mean like you can still have the separation of like, when a deployment goes out, even if stuff is somewhat decoupled so that you've got mm-hmm. like, yeah, right. You, you can, but you do have to develop new processes to do that. Right. So, right. so it's a new, and I think, I think it's basically like, there's just, it's a pros cons thing, like with anything else. Right. Which is we can automatically make deployments, all that kind of stuff at this point. And so for the most part, there's no real incentive to do that, except as kind of the question asker notes, uh, app store review for any app store, um, mm-hmm. except for steam is 
fucking ass pain, right? And mm -hmm. it's an unpredictable thing where you're going to say like, cool, we fixed the issue, we added the feature or whatever. Uh, and then maybe the store guidelines have changed. Maybe you've got some rando who doesn't know what they're doing. You know, what, who knows, right? And now all of a sudden you're like trying to get everybody on all the platforms that has the game, try to get them to fix. And now you can't. And now you're stuck for a week while you, you know, move something three pixels to the side to make somebody happy about their trademark, whatever. Right. So, so, so it can, so that that process can be a nightmare. And depending on how frequently you're deploying, mm -hmm. if you're doing like a live services game and you have to deploy to Apple or to Switch, uh, like weekly, then. Yeah, separate. <laughs> separate those concerns, yeah. deliver stuff over the web because you will not be able, you won't be able to do it. It wouldn't be possible because you can't trust the guideline process. It, it's a strange experience to be like, well, I've made a bug fix, time to ship it to my customers. And then this third party just steps in the middle and they're like, nah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> and it's never, I'm not gonna let you do that. <laughs> yeah. And like we've we've literally I, th I don't think we've ever, maybe once in all of the times we've gone through like App Store review, right? Actually had an issue surface that was a real player facing problem. Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah, think there's, would, I would classify anything that has hung us up as a substantial, an actually substantial problem. No, they were all, well, they were right. all like it, nonsense guideline things that, that yeah. were, that we actually didn't even do anything wrong either. It was just that the person interpreting it was like, uh, no, I've decided no, this time. Us. That this yeah. violates the rules. Yeah, I'd say between like uh, between all the different platforms that we've that we've been on that have different certification things, we've probably had our games rejected maybe thirty to forty times. And every every time it has happened, we have appealed it, and yeah. they've been like, "Okay, never mind, it's fine." Yeah, sometimes they do appeal every time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have, yeah. So we have to keep like running up the chain, and we're like, "It's fine," and then eventually somebody's like, "All right, it's fine." Yeah. Um, it's but just it's just that like that weird unpredictability waste of, of time. yeah, just like somebody's. And, and you know, it's I, I understand it um, on sort of like a, a a high level business thing, which is like if you're the owner of a platform, you don't want somebody distributing malicious content or malware or viruses or porn or you know whatever like through your sure. Your store. And if that's what they were checking for, I'd be all about it. Easy check. But ambiguously, not, none of our games have been that, right? Yeah, yeah. but that's not what the uh, that's not what the, most of those. Well, guide, and the problem uh, is they have are, twenty yeah. pages of guidelines, right? that they're now trying to like check your game against. And most of them are not concrete enough to have just a simple yes, no kind of an answer. Right. Well, especially and in the game space, like most of those are not games, games related at all. Right. So it's like, it just doesn't even. Well, games have their own subset of additional guidelines. Right. So yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and they're also the guidelines are changing all the time. So the people on all ends have to be keeping track with, again, these 20 pages. Of of guidelines. Well, I will say though, yeah. it has the, the app review process has gone from, I think when we started, it was, I think it was, was it two weeks when we started? Four uh, on, on then, iOS. On iOS, it was some. No, it was, it was it was about it was about four or five days. Yeah, it was five days. within a week. Yeah, it's down yeah. to like anywhere from it's like usually five hours now. typically. Yeah. So it, it's also on the other part of it that's changed, which is like it's just not. Even if we get rejected, you know, we have our we have our builds done. We're not. It's not so fly by the seat of your pants, right? Where we're not just like builds done. We have gotta get it out Deploy. right now. It's yeah. like yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it there's a more more of a process in place to make things. So well, and we also so. we also now just assume there's going to be uh, unpredictability in our deployment schedule, and so yeah. that's that's baked Big into deal. all of our plans for how we're going to do stuff. Um, which again, mm -hmm. like I, I think Sam, to your point, like that all that stuff is for them usually fast enough these days uh, mm -hmm. that as long as you're not doing stuff that obviously breaks guidelines, um, even if you are trying to deploy once a week or something like that, uh, you probably still could you would just kind of have to still have things delayed in such a way that you would like have last week's deployment or last week's build deployed right. the next week would be the plan kind of a thing right and also know that at some point if you're if you're deploying 50 deployments a year uh a few of those are going to get held up for real um because mm -hmm. it's a random chaotic process uh, so yeah which, which is to say like the, the goal but the goal of like delivering stuff over the wire is should not be to bypass those things, it should be to reduce the number of deployments, right? Because yeah. deployments are also, they're expensive for the player. They're expensive for you. Uh, uh, they also, users can choose if and when to update their game itself, right? But mm -hmm. if the game, when it loads, is checking the internet to ask, hey, are there updates, right? Then you actually can keep your Guarantees fleet of deployments way more up to date. Um, and mm -hmm. especially if you're doing like multiplayer stuff, live services things, that kind of thing. Kind of required uh, for a lot of those. Yeah, you probably want to try to like separate your game more strongly between like 
treating your game itself as a platform and then all the data and assets and stuff as resources that can go over the web. Um, that said, that all comes with those other, like we talked about a lot, uh, especially with the game changer stuff and all that, right? Like version management. Once, you, once you're hitting scale and hitting multiple yeah. platforms and like doing all this stuff, uh, version management becomes the real problem and like understanding what's even deployed, you know, like which version mm-hmm. of the game engine do people have, which version of the game do people have. If you, The more you separate stuff, the harder that problem gets. Because mm-hmm. if you're now, if now what's happening is like your audience has a range of versions of your game because who knows when they've updated, right? And a tight range of versions of the content that's deployable over the web, right? Because they won't all get it instantly because they might not be connected mm-hmm. to the internet. Who knows, right? Uh, then you have to be keeping track of two now of like, okay, how do I know when like the assets I deploy over the web stop being compatible with a version of the of the game and and how do I bake that into the system so that once someone's game gets too out of date, I know that. And how do you do that when you have a, ga- a game where you've got like, in our case, literally hundreds of kinds of assets that are getting yep. deployed, right? Where any one of those could have compatibility problems with any one you know, version mm-hmm. of a past version of the game and almost never the same version, right? How do you start managing that? And that shit is a nightmare. So, cause I think to me, like the main reason like that I'm happy with what we're doing is because of that, which is if we can get our, it actually. Yeah. If we can yeah. just have a single artifact, we know exactly what it is. Uh, there's a very small number of, of sort of configurations of it, right? As in like- yeah, It's self-contained. It's self-contained, then it's so much easier to test. It's so much easier to do support. Mm-hmm. It's so much easier to understand what the hell is going on in your deployments. Um, that uh, well, I think that's the, that is the best way to do it when you are dealing with fairly complex uh, games and dealing with scale and like multiple mm-hmm. markets and stuff. Yeah. And there, there's one kind of final, in my mind, kind of goofy thing about this- all these like certification processes is it actually reminds me a lot of like uh going through tsa at the airport <laughs> I do, yeah. which is like it's just theater they they make a they make a big show of checking all kinds of stuff but like they're not they're not reverse compiling the the binary and digging through the code to see what's in there right because you could very easily just write something that's like oh after this date start showing users this thing, yep. you know, and that date could be a month after, after it goes through review. This is or, literally what Epic did to trigger the lawsuit with Google and yeah. Apple. They, yeah. they had the yeah, store they, just turned on after like in the same build, right? Which had been through yeah. review. Yeah. yeah. They oh, can't you could even like, anything. Yeah. you could public, you could like send a game into the review. It's like a very simple game, right? But then actually it's a completely different game. Then you just like yep. flip a switch on your server yep. that like when the game boots up, it checks your server and flips over to something else completely, right? Like there is, or just there finally is, deploys its malware. You know? Yeah, there's <laughs> actually yeah. zero possibility of the review process actually catching a bad actor who well, wants actually, to get around it. Well, yeah, who wants to get around it? That's true. Um, yeah. It, it, yeah. It does, it's the same idea as like a lock on your door, right? It can, like, it can it's, catch an idiot. It, it's actually <laughs> – it, it takes – you can learn how to pick a lock in like half an hour, right? And yeah, and once you know how to do it, you can pick basically any – like or you could just break a lock, window. Right? You know? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, either way, the, the, the point being, though, that like, but there is a difference between if somebody just walks up to your house and tries the door and they can just open it, right? Yeah. Versus yeah. they have to do something. And especially because also what it feels like to have done it, it's like, I'm a, right? It's a different kind of a thing. And so I, I think this is the equivalent of you've locked your front door, but every other door in your house is unlocked. Like that's what the app store review, which is like, if you, if somebody just goes into just the immediate direct path and they'd be like, oh, there's an obstacle yeah. here. But if they don't think about anything else or any other way to circumvent it, right? Um, then that's the only situation in which that, that person would get yeah. stopped. But right? I do, but I do think there's, there's a huge benefit to that though, because it's, it's kind of the same as any, like all security is the same, which is all security is defeatable, right? Mm-hmm. If you put enough effort into it or if you have the resources to do it, uh, it's that who can defeat it is and yeah. the, the, the yeah. number of people who can defeat it. As that shrinks, you have less bullshit to deal with, right? Because yeah, yeah. Those, and it's, and it's probably the case that like ninety nine percent of people are doing like low effort bullshit and yeah. will give up immediately when they run into a roadblock. Yeah. That's right? actually that's <laughs> actually the real premise of security is that which is that your goal isn't to actually literally. just to wear people out and make them give up. <laughs> it's, it's, well, it's, it's because like Most you acknowledge. It's just yeah. to acknowledge the fact that, like, I, like if if a, if a state if a state actor, you know, if like if if a uh, say the Korea NSA or Russia or the like, NSA, if they wanted to get into our databases and get our data, 
There I no. They'd be there uh, there's immediately. Nothing right. I could do could stop that. Nothing. Yep. Right. Uh, and and we don't even know what they can do. But like even mm-hmm. the stuff that we know they can do, I already know I can't stop it. Right. Uh, it's just going to happen. And so my goal with security is like not to say I can guarantee that this thing, like that my systems cannot be you know cannot be breached by anybody. It's to say no. I want to make sure that like some rando running there hack all the website software because that's a thing that exists, right? If they go run it, that shouldn't work, right? Yeah. Like the people yeah, who or, are just trying like, to like do the the low effort, like grab a thing off the shelf, run it and try to like get a hold of our data. Like I want to make sure that that stuff doesn't work and that it's a little, and that takes some effort so that the people who then are the ones who actually break into our shit are the ones who are trying to break into our shit specifically and who know what they're doing. Because again, I can't stop that. But most people who are breaking into shit aren't even trying to get into your shit specifically. They're just trying to get a hold of everything, right? Yeah. Getting some shit. Yeah. yeah. And so the, so the reality is, is that is that because most people aren't targeting you specifically, um, that security theater has a place, which is that it keeps like if you if you actually go like look at our, our analytics or if you look at our uh, telemetry and analytics for our all the web requests going to Rumpus, um, at any given time, a solid like ten percent of it is requests to to URLs that don't exist that are common URLs found in various kinds yeah. of web software. Free right? play. Yeah. yeah. And this is, this is stuff that like, cause it's like, like, like PHP portal things and like, and like, and the people are, are also sending requests to like the things that people might have an open, like MySQL database on that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. There are people. And like, I know that those people don't even know what the fuck rumpus is. They don't know what bscotch.net is. Right. It's just a website that they, it's just, they're just hitting every website they can hitting, with yeah. a robot. Right, because and I know this because also many of them are contact are trying to connect directly to the IP address, right? Which means they just have a they're just taking a list of IP addresses rather than like connecting mm. to bscotch.net, right? They're just taking they're just scanning IP addresses, trying and then trying different URLs and then trying different default passwords, right, etc. To just to try to get access to stuff because they just want access to stuff. They want people's it's, email. It's addresses. the real world want- equivalent of like if just like throughout the day, every single day, twenty or thirty people would just walk up to your front door and jiggle the door yeah, knob. Yeah, right. Yep. Yeah, right. It's exactly like, that. Yeah. But but it's, only people do it, right? <laughs> so like, because people don't do that like in the real world, right? But on the web, mm-hmm. that's what's happening. That's just literally Constantly, what's happening Constantly. with every website. Yeah. yeah. And so <laughs> so yeah, that's the idea. It's like if the door, if it's just open, then yeah, now thirty people get to come in and rummage through your shit, right? If there's mm-hmm. a lock on it and thirty people come up and check, then maybe once every like year, after thousands of people have gone through, one of them will be like, no, I actually want to get in here, and I brought my log pick set, right? Yeah. Like. And that's the kind of thing you're trying to prevent with like most of tech security, um, which is to say there's there's a which is all just to say there's a piece of the review process that I can accept. It's, that I get it's worth it, having right? sure. uh, yeah, yeah. for for that but it's, reason. But it's the yeah. fact that it's not actually focused on that. It's not really focused on like privacy and security. Um, that's th- those are two framing, pieces but. of it. But it also it's all about like design and about maintaining. Um, it's also it's about it's about these platforms maintaining their asymmetrical power over the developers who oh, are that's deploying stuff there, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, if, because that's what it's actually about. And then the security and privacy things are like also things, right? That they, that they get added in. Yeah. Rather than it being the only thing that actually they're trying to accomplish. Um, yes. For example, like you, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't publish a game on iOS that, that is a satire making fun of Apple. Yeah. Like that would be a violation of their brand guidelines. Yep. How you how you're allowed to convey it, right? And so, like that would just that would get rejected because a big part of that too is about the preservation of the ecosystem and the the vibes, you know. Yeah, which brand. again, like I, you know, I kind of get it in the sense that if I had a platform and somebody wanted to put something on the platform that was specifically making fun of me, oh, you know, yeah. I'd, be like, I'd be like, I don't uh, like this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I think I think what's interesting is what I get. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're talking yeah. about kind of I think two different things because one is one is the initialization of something on the store for the first time versus like updates, right? Yeah, and I think when you look at a when you look at something like um, like Steam or how yeah, I think even Xbox does this the same way now, where um, on Steam you have a review process for the initial build of your game. Okay, like the like the first thing you can you wait and you submit to them it takes a couple of days. They get back with any problems. Yeah, Steam is just like, like is this game shaped? Does it seem like this developer is at least somewhat yeah. trustworthy? That's all yeah. that they're asking. And then after that, you don't actually, there's no review. Yeah. If you're submitting patches and stuff, there's no review. There's, you just put it in there and it goes and, it's, and you deploy yeah, it. I think, and you're fine. Yeah, Steam strategy, I think is basically like, do we trust the company it's, who's trying to deploy stuff? Right? It's post hoc. Yeah. You know, if, if, if it turns out that users start reporting the game because it's, you know, it's got weird shit in it or whatever, 
um, then they just pull the game down, right? Yeah. So, yeah. but they which but Google Play is similar, at, right? Yeah. yeah. So then, if you look at how Apple works, though, it's like initialization is the same as doing an update, basically, where it's the yeah, same amount everything. of time, despite the fact that because it's it's it is actually is a little crazy, right? Where it's like okay, it you got to in, in our case, Crashland's been on the store now for what eight years? Yeah, yeah, yep. and eight uh, years, yeah, yeah, eight years. Okay, and still when we deploy it, they're like, I don't know about this. Let's I don't know about these guys. The whole book. And I'm like, really? You just <laughs> I mean, like a little bit of wiggle room. <laughs> like, well, it's a waste uh-huh. of their time. It's a waste it's of everyone's waste. time. It's a waste of everyone's time. At a certain point, yeah, it's a little bit. It's, it's yeah. a bit much. Uh, uh, and so that's that's just kind of the name of the game, though. I guess at this point, you will change. No, no. Uh, all right. Well, I think it's all the time we have for uh, for this week's episode. We'd like to thank our producers, Fat Bard and Sampa Costa, for putting the podcast together, and thanks to our community community moderators. Oh, stumble Com- Community, community moderators, moderators, yes. moderators uh, who keep our Discord running. To get more involved in the Butterscotch community, just go to podcast.bscotch.net, where we have links to the Discord, a way for you to donate, and and links to the podcast archives. And if you haven't yet, head on over to Steam and give Crashlands 2 a wish list. It'll help boost it up the charts and, uh, and help the game be successful when we launch it. So we'd appreciate that. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.